So if you would open your scriptures or open your Bible, we are in Romans 5, uh, uh, verse 20 through chapter 6, verse 14. And the title of our message this morning is uh, Freed from Sin. So let me uh, start off by reading our scriptures, then we'll drop back and we'll discuss. Uh, verse 20 of chapter 5, book of Romans. Uh, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who died has been freed from sin. Verse 8, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So, as we start out this morning, uh, back in uh, the end of uh, chapter 5 and move on to chapter 6, the, the title of our message is Freed from Sin. I want to read out Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. And so the whole aspect of what Paul is, is bringing forth, I believe, in the section of uh, Scripture that we're going to go through this week is the fact that grace is abundant. And sin is abundant. And in the presence of sin grace abounds more abundantly. And in the presence of abounding sin, grace then exceedingly abounds abundantly. And so if in the midst of sin, grace abounds, then if we sin more, then we give grace an opportunity to abound more, right? No, that, that doesn't work that way. But you'd be surprised that many in the church, many who are saved and say they're saved, uh, many believe that because of the grace of God that is abundant, then in the midst of their sins, that will always cover the abundance of sins that they're in the midst of. That they think that, well, if grace abounds uh, more, in the presence of sin, then it really doesn't matter if I sin more because there's that much more grace to cover my sins, and that is just a terrible, bad, theological, inept way to think, or theologically inept way to think. It doesn't work that way. Does grace abound? Absolutely. In the midst of our sin, as we confess and re we repent, does grace abound more? Well, absolutely. But for somebody to make the argument, such as um, Paul is bringing forth here, just addressing what he believes uh, members of the, the church in Rome might think, it's no, don't continue in sin because grace abounds. 
That's, that's ridiculous. You, you're new creations in Christ. You're to put those things uh, of the old man, you're to put them uh, under the blood before our Lord. You're, you're to take and be victorious through the power of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the death that Christ died on our behalf that sin would not have victory over us. Now are we sinless? A lot of the church believes we're sinless. Well, you get saved, you're sinless, right? Ah. It doesn't work that way either. You're not sinless. You're delivered from the power of sin that leads to eternal death. You're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, which now gives you um, the light that's able to illuminate Scripture and in the illumination of Scripture, you're now enabled to walk in light of what you have been reading. And, and in that, we can put on the armor of God. We can put off those things that formerly we walked in. But in that, we're still sinners saved by grace. We still do those things that we should not do. But in that, that's no excuse because grace abounds that we should continue in that, reading out of uh, chapter 5, verses 20 and 21 of our study this morning, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that if sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Very important that Paul reminds us once again, what are the effects of sin? What are the effects of sin um, temporally, it's separation from God. What are the effects of sin if you don't have a relationship with God salvifically? It's eternal death. And, and so many people don't get that. They don't get the fact that apart from having that relationship restored through the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the Holy Spirit pouring out upon us and within us, that we are not saved if, if that transaction hasn't happened. We can say that we're Christians, we can say that we go to church, we can say that we read a Bible which without the Holy Spirit is simply a one-dimensional uh, piece of literature. But if, if we are not his, then you know what? We continue in sin, and the effects of that sin is eternal death. Now, for the saved, if we sin, it's temporal separation and communication, not eternal death. But if we, we are not saved, it is eternal death. Paul also reminds us of the blessings that we have been given. As sin abounded and sin reigned in death, yet in the midst of sin and death, God brought forth his Son, Jesus Christ that grace would reign through righteousness to those who believe. Reading out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, Scripture tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ who has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. See, the going forth of bringing the gospel, the going forth, as uh, Samaritan's first uh, uh, pointed out, it's, it's not in giving these boxes. It's in bringing the gospel to children. It's in bringing the gospel to those who are there with those children and they perhaps would hear. It's in the children going back to their homes. It's, it's such an extensive, um, I guess, spread of information through what? A little box here. A little box. Those who, who bring the box in. Right. Those who take the box to the centers where they're assembled. Right. Those who are assembling them. Right. Those who distribute them. Right. I mean, it's just it's just an ongoing opportunity of, of ministry. And so for us who are in Christ, his grace has abounded towards us. And in that grace abounding towards us, 
then we need to take and bring forth an abundance of those things that we can offer up to him, whether it be our life or whatever. But we, we, we don't do that because life at times is very, very full. Scripture says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How easy does it come off the tongue? I am his. I am saved. I am thankful. I have an eternity with my Lord and Savior. It comes off the tongue pretty easy, right? But how does it come off the tongue and transfer to your feet? How does it transfer to your heart? How does it transfer within the workplace? How does it transfer within your marriage or your familial relationships? How does all that work? Or are we truly thankful enough to offer ourselves to our Lord? Here I am. Use me. Here I am. Take me. Here I am. Do whatever would be for your glory. And if it's for your glory, it certainly is going to be for my good. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So what shall we say then, as verse 1 starts out, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And what is Paul's answer? He says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? It, it would be as if you were at once living in the gutter. And the only sustenance you had was the water that ran into the gutter. The, the only thing that you had to nourish you was the junk that was under the water that ran in the gutter. But yet, in a moment, you were delivered from that. You were, you were brought forward. You were given clean water. You were given clean food. But, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about our new life in Christ. How would you then choose to return to the gutter? How would you then choose to walk away from that which is being provided for you, not has been provided for you, is, is being provided for you? How, how would you make such a decision? But yet many do. Many say, you know what, this, this road is too hard of a road to walk. This this field is too hard of a field to plow. These things that we're in the middle of right now, obviously, God is not here because we continue to go, to go through this. But yet, Scripture says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? See, God is ever-present, and if we don't realize that, then we're going to take and put our eyes on something else. If we don't understand that God is with us in our closets, God is with us when we're by ourselves, God is with us on the freeways when nobody knows who we are except for him, then, then we make a mistake because we shall then perhaps not have a problem with doing those things we've been delivered from. I want to read out of Ephesians Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Scripture tells us, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which he once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So, 
Once we were children of wrath, just like the others. Once we were those who had absolutely no hope. We had hope in ourselves, we had hope in our MasterCard, we had hope in our jobs, we had hope in our IRAs and SEPs and retirement. We had, we had all kinds of hope, but it wasn't a biblical hope. It wasn't an eternal hope. It was a temporal hope in things. And, and the scripture says here in Ephesians 2 that we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Verse 4, this is a Pastor Michael saying here, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, least anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Is God's grace sufficient? Yes. Because it's sufficient and it's abundant, should we continue in our sins? No. That's just, it's a real simple thing. Has he made a way out of our sins for us? Yeah. Has he made a way out of our dilemmas for us? Yeah. We just need to keep focused. Reading out of Romans 6, verses 10 through 14, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Do not let sin continue to reign. Take every thought captive. Have you ever noticed that you're able to have those thoughts that you shouldn't have? Maybe it's just me. I mean, and I'm not up here confessing to you that I'm writing a book of things I shouldn't be thinking about. I'm not doing that. But you ever think something, then immediately you have to go, well, where'd that come from? And you take that thought captive. And in that, you, you, you confess of what you just thought. You remember, and you go a completely different way. And then it's, it's a one and a done. But yet, sometimes in life, a thought comes upon us. And we take and we think of that thought, and we, we put legs to that thought, and, and we dwell on that thought. Pretty soon that thought consumes us. That thought um, takes and it's like the leaven that we're told not to have within us. And, and in that, we need to take our thoughts captive. We need to... Uh, dwell on the things of the Lord, not on the things of the world, because that's what we've been delivered from. We're still in the world. Those things are still pummeling us about. But we're in the world, we're not of the world. Reading out of Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 18. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether it's sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. I like that, slaves of righteousness. Set free from sin. And as the worship team comes up this morning, we have, uh, we have run out of time. 
as the worship team comes up this morning, we'll continue in verse 4 next week, uh, the enormity of Paul's heart for the church, uh, Paul's heart for us, should be no less uh, than our heart for the church and our heart for others. If, if we are in the midst of something that we shouldn't be in the midst of, then you know what? Confess, repent, be forgiven, be restored, and go forward. As far as east is from the west, he will remember that no more. Yet, if you're in continuing habitual sin, then perhaps you need to jump into the Galatians chapter 5. You need to uh, read the litany of those things that um, if you're in the midst of, if you're uh, partaking of them, um, Scripture says, it would do you well to examine your life and, and, and understand, am, am I saved? Am I really saved if I'm continuing in these things? And in that, uh, I'm, not, I'm not telling you that you're going to lose your salvation. I wouldn't do that. But perhaps you weren't saved to begin with. And that's where the crux of the juxt is. Are you his? If you're his, can you sin? Yes. Can you continue in habitual sin? You shouldn't ought to be able to do that. You should recognize that and lay that before the cross. Confess, repent, restore that uh, prayer life, that communication with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he's restored your life with the Father, right? And so in that, as we close out and worship uh, this morning, I think the best thing we can do uh, is rather than be, um, I guess, examiners of the lives of others, because a lot of us like to do that. We like to look at others and go, dang, I'm so happy I'm not doing that. How can they get away with that garbage? You know, the best thing might be to do is turn our eyes inward rather than continue to uh, look outward. Amen?